Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much, Fleur, for the introduction, and good morning. Um, today, I thought I'd share with you an example of how we're using spatial data science to tackle a common business problem in the energy industry, and that is increasing the sales of residential rooftop solar panels. I imagine many of you are not too familiar with Origin Energy, um, so I'll start by telling you a bit about us. We are a leading retailer of electricity and natural gas in Australia. We have approximately 4 million customers, which equates to about a third of the Australian market. We're involved in various different aspects of the energy supply chain, um, and that goes all the way from exploration and production of natural gas to power generation to retailing electricity and gas. Um, it's also worth pointing out that a key area of focus for Origin Energy is uh, in the future of energy, specifically shaping the future of energy. We are one of the founding members of Free Electrons, which is a global consortium of 10 energy utilities worldwide um, that run an annual energy accelerator program. And that's actually how we met Carto, who are one of the participants this year. Before I get into some of the details, I thought it would be worth providing a bit of context around the business problem. Um, so the energy industry is currently at a very interesting point in its history. It's quite evident to everyone in the industry and everyone outside the industry that the next 10 to 20 years are likely to look very different to the preceding 100. Um, and any current company that wants to thrive in this future needs to, go, uh, needs to undergo a period of significant transformation. Um, at Origin, we talk about this in terms of the three Ds, decarbonization, decentralization, and digitization. Look, decarbonization is fairly self-explanatory. This is a challenge facing humanity collectively, and energy is a large part of this. Decentralization is an interesting one. So the traditional method of getting electricity to a home is you typically have a power plant that supplied tens of thousands of customers with energy, with electricity, that will be transported via copper cables to, to homes. What we're seeing now is customers increasingly have the ability to generate their own electricity and more and more to be able to store that on their property. So this is a paradigm shift. Digitization is not unique to energy, obviously. Um, in virtually every industry, we're seeing consumers wanting to interact with their retailers more and more digitally. A key theme that touches each of these is um, renewables, and in particular, solar. Um, so Australia, just, just for a bit of context here, Australia already has one of the highest rates of solar penetration anywhere in the world, and a lot of that comes down to favorable geography. Um, the, the map on your left <laughs> um, shows uh, the, the current, uh, in 2017, shows the amount of renewable generation currently in Australia, with the color of the bubbles, the type of generation, and the size of the bubbles showing the capacity. That equates to about 15% of the total generation in Australia coming from renewables. In case, just as an aside, in case you're wondering why that map has those interesting clusters, that's actually how Australia's population is distributed. So all the major cities are on the eastern seaboard. There's one city, Perth, on the west, and there's nothing else in between. Um, anyway, so getting back to my charts, um, in particular, the chart on the right shows the increase in rooftop solar uh, installations over the last 14 years. As you can see, rooftop installation has really taken off since 2009, but in particular has increased near exponentially in the last couple of years. Um, a common challenge that we face at Origin, and I think this is unique to just about every other large participant in the energy industry, is that while we have a significant market share in traditional electricity and gas retail, this often doesn't translate into what is most likely to be the future, solar sales. Um, so our market share is 30% for electricity and gas and significantly smaller for solar. Some of the challenges that our internal teams face, and this is kind of where we, before, so I'd like to mention this before I go into our approach. Um, when speaking to our sales and marketing teams, um, the types of challenges they faced, for example, our sales team felt they didn't have a framework to prioritize leads. They were kind of treating every customer the same. Um, a lot of leads ended up being disqualified for logistical reasons. Uh, and all of this leads to a very expensive cost to acquire process. For our marketing teams, they echoed largely the same sentiments. Um, they were sort of felt they needed more targeted marketing strategies, and hence they wanted to achieve higher conversion and lower marketing spend. So our approach to address this problem was to develop a solar cross-sell propensity model to be able to provide our customers with more personalized sales and marketing treatments. Um, and the approach we took was fairly straightforward. So the first bit was around data modeling, which as Javier mentioned this morning was about 80% of the time. Um, and then we tested several different machine learning models and picked the champion model. And finally, and most importantly, um, used the output of these machine learning models to change business processes. Um, I'll start by talking about the data. 
Um, so we initially started looking at features coming from internal data sets. So we looked at, we have, we have rich data around product holdings and interactions. Um, so we initially looked at these as a set of features um, and tested a series of machine learning models from them. And to be honest, those models weren't great. And that would be expected. Um, because if you think about the types of customers that would be interested in installing solar, um, none of the key features and factors are actually captured if you look at just product interaction information. So what we did next was join our internal data to external data, and that included things like demographics. So we firstly looked at um, ABS data. So ABS stands for Australian Bureau of Statistics, which is our Census Bureau. Um, and we also looked at a few external data providers like Experian and Ilion. Uh, once, we, once we kind of did some feature engineering on this broader data set, look, we did get a significant improvement in our modeling performance, but once again, not enough for us to be able to generate, to be able to actually influence and change a business process. And there's a few reasons for this. Firstly, census data in Australia is, is updated every few years. I understand in the US it might be a bit more frequently, but still, um, going back to a few slides ago where I showed the rate of change of solar, something that moves a little bit less quickly is not likely to be representative. Um, so it was only when we kind of introduced locational information and in particular satellite information that we actually saw we were able to significantly improve our predictive models. Um, I'll go through some of the intuition of this. So firstly, solar installation is site specific and very localized. At the highest level, a key driver of solar uptake is financial payback, and that is driven by generation capacity. Um, a key driver of solar generation is cloud cover, or actually lack of cloud cover. So latitude is strongly correlated, uh, latitude and longitude, but in particular latitude, strongly correlated with solar generation. So that was something we included in our model. Getting a little bit more specific and a bit more localized, um, this is something we see from insights from our data, from speaking to field crews, from speaking to sales teams, and even literally just going for a drive around neighborhoods that a key predictor, at least our hypothesis, was that a key predictor of solar uptake in a particular home would be how many other homes in the neighborhood or how many other homes in the street already had solar installed. And obviously there's a few, you know, solar is an expensive, a solar system is, is an expensive outlay. And there's obviously correlations with income and demographics and that sort of thing, but even correcting for that, there's obviously a, a key factor there. Finally, and looking even more localized, um, one, of the, one of the key issues that our sales team faced were, was that of disqualified leads. And often a, site, a disqualified lead may happen if, for example, a customer is interested in installing a panel on their roof, but the roof is not large enough, or the orientation of the roof is wrong, or the material that the roof is made of doesn't support panels. Or even if all of that works out, often if there's a lot of trees around the, uh, around the property, that creates shading, and shading works just like cloud cover. It basically reduces the amount of generation in the panel. So it was only when we sort of, and we had to purchase all this data externally, but it was only when we augmented our feature store with locational and geospatial data that we actually saw uh, a significant improvement in predictive modeling. Um, I'll touch on this really quickly in the interest of time. Um, so in terms of implementation, we effectively, once we had our data set, we did feature engineering, um, we tested a series of tree-based models and ended up with uh, using a gradient boosting model for the final model. Um, we did most of our development in Python, uh, but did use AWS SageMaker for the hyperparameter tuning. So how did any of this get used to change a business process? Well, the first, the, the output of the models themselves were a set of propensity scores. So the first thing we did is we segmented our customer base into four cohorts based on their solar uptake propensity. Um, our high propensity customers were six to eight times more likely to take up solar. The, uh, the, sorry, that was a very high propensity. The high propensity, which was the next kind of quintile, was um, uh, two to six times more likely. The medium propensity, one to two times more likely. And interestingly, the vast majority of our customer base was actually low propensity. So in the past, our marketing campaigns would have gone out and targeted our entire customer base of 2.8 million electricity customers. Um, and obviously, we would not have had much response. But this showed us immediately that focusing on maybe just the top 20% or the top 10% even um, of customers with a more targeted campaign would result in significantly lower marketing spend and yet um, a significantly better response. Um, the next, uh, so, so in addition to providing sort of propensity scores, um, something else that was requested by the business and, and uh, we felt was really important uh, if, to you know, assist in the adoption of this was to provide insights into which features were actually important. So it's one thing to provide kind of saying, here's a black box model that produces a set of propensity scores, 
But the, what our marketing team in particular was looking for is which features in particular are important and, and what they can do and which are actionable drivers that they can use to develop personalized content for our customers. Um, just something we found really useful for this, which I thought I should, I should share, is um, it's often challenging with complex models like gradient boosting models. Um, there's a trade-off between the complexity of the model and explainability. Uh, we used uh, SHAP values to get around this, and SHAP, for those of you that may not be uh, kind of familiar with this, um, stands for Shapely Additive Explanation. It's a Python library, and something we would really recommend for a use case like this. So, as a result, once we had our customers segmented into cohorts and we had more insights into what drivers, of, what, what are the underlying drivers of solar uptake, our digital teams were able to create more personalized experience for our customers. On the left is an example from my personal, my account page. So in addition to being an Origin Energy employee, I'm also a customer. Um, and uh, the solar model, the, our propensity model, predicts me as a high propensity customer, which seems about right. So when I log on to my Origin, my account page, this is actually what pops up. So it, it kind of gives me targeted messaging and including some of, the, some of the line items there that may resonate with me, and they do. Um, now, this is not where we're sort of stopping with this. So this was solar. Um, uh, the plan for this is to expand this out to storage, to batteries, and also to electric vehicles in the future. So looking at what's there on the right, that is, in, that, that is a mock-up as opposed to the one on the left, which is a real page, but that's sort of how we want to expand this out and roll it out to our customers. Um, I'll probably stop there on talking about this particular use case, but it is by no means the only application of spatial data science that we've used in the energy industry. Some of the other applications we'll just very quickly touch on now are things like forecasting customer demand. Now, this is an interesting one because customer demand is very heavily driven by weather, and weather is very localized. So key to this problem was actually a spatial join between weather stations and load density. So not just population density, but energy consumption density. Um, another more traditional kind of spatial data science problem that we've, we've tackled is route optimization for LPG business. So LPG are uh, liquefied petroleum gas tankers, you know, the ones you use for your barbecue and that sort of thing, and these are, they are typically delivered by uh, trucks. Um, getting back to retail, we've also seen a significant improvement in other models that were kind of non-geospatial or non-locational um, once we included locational intelligence. Um, so things like predicting customer churn, how likely a customer is to move home, and also looking at cross-sell models. Um, look, that's, that's all for me today. Uh, I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but I'm more than happy to have a chat with anyone uh, during the break if they're interested. Thank you very much for your time, everyone.